I'll, I'll just go to Sachs on this one. Sachs, what is your take at this point with the resignations and then this power move by Satya? In terms of what? Unprecedented nature of this value destruction. Take it where you want to go. Well, yeah, I think it is unprecedented. Um, I mean, it's not unprecedented for a founder or CEO to be fired by a board. I mean, that does happen. Nobody likes it, but it does occasionally happen. However, it only happens when a company is in crisis and things have gone off the rails or there's some sort of criminal misconduct. It takes, you know, something really egregious uh, to get a founder CEO fired. And here, not only do we not have that, I mean, OpenAI was on a trajectory to be one of the next great companies of Silicon Valley. I mean, it was, I guess they were working on a $90 billion financing round um, up from 30 just a short while ago. If you had asked most people in Silicon Valley what the next trillion dollar software company was likely to be, I think everybody would have said OpenAI. I mean, it was one of those companies like a Google, like a Microsoft, like a you know Facebook or Meta, where um, you know they had basically figured out something very fundamental. They had engineered the next kind of technology platform shift, and so OpenAI was one of those generational companies. And so, and everything was calm. Everything was working. I mean, this is a company on top of its game, and a founder apparently who was at the top of his game. And so I think this kind of came out of the blue on Friday. And so when they put out that announcement on Friday saying that Sam hadn't been candid, which as far as these things go was a very, um, you know, that, that was a pretty harsh statement. I mean, normally when boards put out statements about a founder getting fired, they're, they kind of, they don't say much. And that was, as far as these things go, a pretty harsh statement. So I think we were all kind of bracing, waiting for the other shoe to drop to find out that there was some horrible misconduct that had occurred here. And then, you know, with each passing day, that hadn't come out. And um, and then, like like you said, Sonny, um, Ilya put out this mea culpa. So now there's no reason to believe it even exists. Um, and so I think that's what's so inexplicable about this is... Um, there doesn't appear to have been any reason for for this, and um, this is just, it seems like a case of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Me, I mean, again, this is not a company in crisis. This was a company that was on its way to being, you know, a centicorn uh, company and maybe a trillion-dollar company one day. The company that basically, I mean, when ChatGPT launched on November 30th last year, that ushered in this whole wave of AI yes. that we're seeing everyone build on now. I mean, this was the next great technology platform shift. I mean, the, all of Silicon Valley has basically swarmed around this. And so, you know, this was not a company that needed to make a change. It had no problems whatsoever. It was all kind of blue skies and up from here. And then you had this thing happen on Friday. And I think that's what's so inexplicable. Well, let's do a little speculation there. That's a great summary. And I think if you look at the wording of what they said, um, you would think just logically in game theory, if they had a real case against Sam, like some actionable item, they wouldn't have gone out with some meek, you know, excuse, this, this milk toast excuse that he wasn't perfectly candid. Um, and since they're all getting destroyed, I would think they would have leaked the board by now to defend themselves. Hey, Sam did X thing that is, and listen, it's, fairly clear now that if there was some smoking gun here that he'd done something unbelievably horrible or fraudulent, let's say, it would have come out by now. So what is your theory, Sachs, of what these people were thinking? Can I just add one thing before David yes. jumps in there, which is yeah. um, Emmett in his message made very clear that the board hasn't even explained to him why they fired Sam. And he wants to kick off an investigation to understand what happened. And <laughs> my, my head's <laughs> spinning. <laughs> yeah. My first act as new CEO will be to investigate why the last CEO was <laughs> fired and why I was hired. Why would you just ask that question during your job interview? Yeah. What's the, what, what do you think? happened in terms of why the board jumped the fence, went rogue and fired him? What's your best speculation, Sachs? Just putting all the pieces together and looking at the chessboard? Well, let me just first say that I think that taking a drastic action and then clamming up and not explaining it is the worst possible strategy. I mean, I think that if, if you take a drastic action, you have to explain it. 
And if this was about values, if the company was going in a different direction from a values perspective uh, than it was originally created with, then that would be all the more reason to explain it because you basically want to write your manifesto or counter manifesto on what the real values of this company should be. Uh, but obviously they didn't do that. Um, and again, if there's some sort of horrible criminal misconduct, I think that, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta get something out there to explain what it is that you've done. Uh, mm-hmm. but again, with each passing day that there's no explanation, you begin to come to the conclusion that there was no well thought out reason for this. And I guess the big piece of evidence we have towards that, Sonny, is that Ilya came out with a tweet at 5 a.m. Pacific time, Monday morning, right before markets open, uh, saying, I deeply regret my participation in the board's actions. I never intended to harm OpenAI. I love everything we've built together, and I will do everything I can to reunite the company. What's the theory here, Sonny or Sachs? Yeah, uh, I mean, look, I can't understand, you know, how... You, look, people can change their minds and everyone has a right to do it, but then um, to have it go through so much public uh, turmoil for the company, you know, this should have been part of the process. And the only thing I can really speculate from this is this just shows sort of a lack of maturity of the governance structure of the company to basically is the kind of thing you want to double and triple and quadruple check and maybe get some external folks involved as well and, and get their opinion. And so... Uh, it's re- really disappointing. I mean, nice to see that he changed and hopefully that saves things here, but disappointing in terms of how the company was run. And it kind of makes you wonder what else is happening there. But Sachs, what, what are your thoughts? My main thought is when I saw that is um, it made me re- immediately think, well, there's some, no smoking gun here. I mean, again, if you're going to yes. fire the founder CEO of the next great software company in Silicon Valley, again, you know, $90 billion company on its way to a trillion who started this whole AI wave, everything on the surface appeared to be as calm, you know, as, you know, uh, as, as calm can be, like no indication whatsoever that anything's going wrong. So if you're going to fire that person out of the blue, then there has to be a really good reason, you know, not just like some minor reason, like a smoking gun. So and then if you, if you retract and recant and make an apology, then it indicates, well, there can't have been anything there. Can't just have been like a difference of opinion over something unimportant. There had to be something factual. So my interpretation of that mea culpa is that there is nothing factual there. Uh, yeah. But I've come to the conclusion, Sachs, that it's two things. One, they were, they were a little upset at Sam for doing these deals, whether it's the Johnny Ive, you know, new phone, AI phone, or the new chipset with, you know, maybe some investors in uh, Mina, whatever it was, that was tweaking them. And then maybe there was a little bit of tweaking with his public profile, possibly. But then I think the second major item that was tweaking them was the pace at which he was releasing things. And when he released agents and apps that we talked about, that's super powerful. And the the agents are a trigger for the people who are concerned about AI spinning out of control. Once you fire up agents and they start acting, you know, on that road toward autonomy, that's what makes all these doomers, as they're being called, uh, or decelerists, uh, get triggered. So it sounds to me like it was. I'm going with what you said. You know, it's it's philosophy. If it was the second one, Jason. Yes. Um, my God, man, stick to your guns. I mean, if you really think this is going to end civilization then like write a public letter explaining what you did. Don't like just meekly say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't think it through. Yes. It would be that's why time would to come clean. Yeah. It, it's, it's probably not that I think it's, it, it is just tied to focus and effort. Like if you take a step back and look at everything that's come out, it's very clear that a number of people that went to join and, you know, Elon kicked this off, right? Started it as a nonprofit, put, you know, I think $40 million in. And a lot of the, and one of the videos that, you know, I watched uh, over the weekend was where he talks about recruiting Ilya. And as it was one of the hardest things he ever did, and it led to his, um, you know, fracturing of relationship with um, Sergey over at Google. And so um, that, 
think about what it took to recruit him and maybe not make it about economics because he was recruiting him into a open, uh, sorry, a nonprofit at that point. And you have to imagine he's brought other people from his past research lab and Google and other places. And so when you start seeing this commercial stuff happening, um, you can you can understand if you've been brought over and it wasn't economic and you're starting to see you know uh, an app store emerge and all these things happen and you want to focus on your research and forwarding AGI, um, perhaps you know that is really what's what's causing havoc. Yeah, I mean, look, that could be it. Well, I guess we won't know. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that if the motivation here was based on values, um, in the way you're saying, you know, if if the board's position had been that Sam is exploiting the technology in a way that makes us uncomfortable, either because he's exploiting it for personal gain or, or you know, more importantly, that they're developing these agents that could get out of control and we're worried about the AI safety and all that kind of stuff, then why wouldn't you go out there and say it? I mean, put make your argument, make your case, defend yourself. Um, don't just meekly go quiet and then retract and recant. I mean, was this a threat to civilization or not? All right, business to business founders need to understand two things. Hey, B2B marketing is hard. It's really hard. And number two, LinkedIn ads makes it so simple for you. Why is business to business marketing so hard? Well, decision makers are hard to get to. They know how to hide. They know how to not get annoyed. They're very, very clever about this. Trust me, I'm one of those decision makers. And they're so hard to identify and target on the internet. They're stealth. We can't find them anywhere. Well, actually, you can find them one place. That's LinkedIn. There are 70 million decision makers on LinkedIn. You know, as a decision maker, we have to be there. And 10 million of those 70 million are in the C-suite. Chief security officer, chief strategy officer, CEO, CFO, COO. Ooh, that's like 1% of the total audience of executives. And they have to be on LinkedIn because that's where they find talent. That's where they get information. That's where they get the talented people to come to apply to jobs at their company. And that's where they find talented people, right? So while they're there, you get to use LinkedIn ads to get your message in front of the right people. This is very, very simple. LinkedIn equals business business equals LinkedIn. So I want you to get started today. And you will understand very quickly why LinkedIn is the place to be for B2B. We're going to give you $100 in credits. So you don't have to spend any money, you get to test it yourself linkedin.com slash this week in startups, no spaces, no dashes, you type out those four beautiful words this week in startups, and you get $100 terms and conditions do apply.